Good evening, everybody. I think uh, very few people are here on the scene, but uh, I'll try to finish as fast as possible because I have to give the other speakers an opportunity to speak. Now, um, we all know that there are two major challenges in infertility today. One is the low ovarian reserve, and the other is thin endometrium. So, um, we'll be speaking on thin endometrium. Okay. Numerous treatment strategies have so far been proposed for, tre for treating refractory thin endometrium, either with or without Asherman syndrome. And here we have a list of all the therapies, extended estrogen therapy, tamoxifen, long-term pentoxifilin, uh, tocopherol, low-dose HCG, aspirin, L-arginine, sildenafil, and granulocyte colony stimulating factor. But when all these are exhausted, you still have a group of patients who don't respond to any of these strategies. And here, the current scenario is the use of platelet-rich plasma and mesenchymal stem cells. They act through cytokine production, growth factor production, NK cell activity reduction, the TH17 and TH1 decrease, and TREC cell and TH2 increase. Now, the minimal cutoff value for endometrial thickness for a successful transfer is 7 millimeters, and value over 9 predict greater implantation rate. And a poor endometrium less than 7, you have poor implantation rates and increased miscarriage rates. So why is the endometrium thin? Here, it's very important to understand this because we should really prevent a thin endometrium. During a hysteroscopic myomectomy, you have to be really, really careful not to damage the, my, the endometrium. And uh, many cases where it can be done laparoscopically, you try to remove it laparoscopically rather than cut the endo endometrium and take out the myoma. And uh, cesarean sections, you have to be very careful. Overzealous curatage, this can be prevented. Infections, immediate recognition and treatment will not uh, damage it to this extent. Tuberculosis, chronic endometritis. Now, a chronic endometritis leads to a thin endometrium and intrauterine adhesions and Asherman syndrome, which is the most severe form of chronic endometritis. Now, whenever you see a case of uh, um, Asherman syndrome or you do an evaluation hysteroscopically, if there are adhesions, you can divide the adhesions by using the scissors as far as possible. Here, this is the latest uh, a presentation showing that the, in the homium YAG laser is very useful in patients with Asherman syndrome, and it says it's easy, effective, and safe. But if you use the scissors very carefully with proper distension, it's as good as separating by, with the uh, NDIAG laser. But uh, following this, you can uh, put in the platelet-rich plasma or mesenchymal stem cells, and it really helps in healing the endometrium. And with a second-look hysteroscopy, you would find that there's a major difference. Sometimes the additions do persist, and then you can repeat the adhesiolysis and the PRP and mesenchymal stem cells as well. Now, platelet-rich plasma has growth factors which are rich in vasoendothelial growth factor, epidermal growth factors, platelet-derived growth factor, transforming growth factors, and other cytokines, which lead to proliferation, growth, vascularization, and once again, an increased endometrial thickness. Now, how do you manage a thin endometrium? Now, initially, we were actually using installation of platelet-rich plasma into the endometrium. I think for over two years, we've been doing this and finding good successes. But there were a group of patients who just would not respond to how many of our installations. We used a, a normal platelet-rich plasma. We used an enriched platelet-rich plasma, which is enriched with growth factors, but none of them made any uh, you know, difference. Uh, the endometrium would just drop, or it did not reach the thickness where it was ready at least seven to do an embryo transfer. Now, the latest thing in the use of platelet-rich plasma is hysteroscopic subendometrial installation of platelet-rich plasma into the endomyometrial junction. And this is a wonderful paper by Meenu Agarwal, and this was a pilot study. Now, in patients whose embryo transfers had been previously canceled due to a thin endometrium, the injection of PRP guided by hysteroscopy into the endomyometrial junction improves the thickness and vascularity. This was a cross-sectional study which included 32 patients aged between 27 and 39 years, suffering from primary or secondary infertility, who were selected for hysteroscopic installation of PRP. A retrospective assessment was done. The improvement in endometrial thickness greater than 7 millimeters on commencement of progesterone treatment in 24 out of 32 patients, that's 75%, 
they improved after hysteroscopy guided injection of PRP into the subendometrial zone. After PRP installation, the endometrium from 7 went on to 8.8 .8 in 24 out of 32 patients, and all 24 patients underwent frozen embryo transfer. And these are the results. The pregnancy uh, beta HCG was positive in 12, which means 50% of patients, the beta HCG was positive. Clinical pregnancy rate was 41.66%. The biochemical pregnancy was 8.33. Ongoing pregnancies were 12.5. Live birth rates, 20.83%. And missed abortions in 8.33%. So you would uh, see that the miscarriage rate is lower than in a normal population where it's normally about 15%. So the conclusion was PRP injection into the subendometrial region is consistent with histologically proven regeneration of the endometrium from the endometrial junction. There is improvement of endometrial thickness and higher pregnancy rates in cases of previously cancelled embryo transfer due to a thin endometrium. So this is actually the way it is done. The, you can either use an egg collection needle or you can use a needle which I have devised. So this is a hysteroscopic installation of PRP. The beveled edge of the ovum pickup needle is oriented towards the uterine cavity in order to determine the exact depth of insertion. The, the rings here actually tell you the depth. So the markings on the ovum pickup needle help to determine the correct depth of insertion. The prepared PR, once the rings disappear under the endometrium, prepared PRP is pushed into the endometrial junction and the needle is withdrawn under vision. No leakage of injected fluid was seen on withdrawal of the needle. PRP was installed within 20 to 30 minutes of its preparation. So this is a hysteroscopic installation, which was done in Prashant Fertility. So you see the a view of the entire endometrial cavity, the ostium, and uh, we're now injecting the needle. You see it goes right under the end endometrium, and we've injected the PRP. I injected in four different sites, the two lateral walls, the fundus and the posterior wall. So you can see it going right under the endometrium. And this is the exact region where the PRP should go. And once again, into the right lateral wall. So it goes right under the endometrium. We inject it. And when you take it out, there is no leak of the fluid at all. It, you can only see the cavity. So um, this is the way it is done. And once again, into the left lateral wall. The whole procedure takes about maybe about five minutes and uh, it should be done very swiftly and most important of all you should be you should start injecting only after you have reached the subendometrial region not before that so the way we do it in prashant fertile we were using the uh, luprolide estate injection initially and the oral contraceptive pill was started on day 16 and the um, a luprolide injection was also started. Sorry, the oral contraceptive pill was started on day five. Luprolide was given on day 16, and hysteroscopic PRP installation was day, done on day 23. So this is a preparatory cycle. And in the next cycle, embryo transfer was planned, and here we gave estradiol valerate two milligram three times, and when the endometrium reached greater than nine millimeters, progesterone was started. Now the statistics, 163 patients received subendometrial PRP, Number of embryo transfers done was 99. Number canceled, 84. The positive patients were 55% and the negatives were 44.5%. So this is very important because if this had not worked, these would have been candidates for surrogacy. There is a big hue and cry about surrogacy with the new law coming in. And we have to find ways of improving the endometrium so that they're able to deliver with their own uterus. Now, <clears throat> the... Uh, Ongoing pregnancies were 36.5, live births 45.4%, and miscarriages 18.1%. Now, still there are a group of patients who have not responded to subendometrial installation. So, there was a new thing which had, uh, a medication which had come, not a medication, new therapy which had come in, and that was mesenchymal stem cell therapy. It's obtained from the umbilical cord or bone marrow. We use umbilical cord stem cells, and um, mesenchymal stem cells is now the most attractive option in regenerative medicine, and it, installation of the stem cells into the uterine cavity was initially done, and we were doing this as well. 
uh, you would see it in the uh, following slides, but the current studies show that hysteroscopic subendometrial installation of mesenchymal stem cells, like the PRP, is a better alternative. So here you see that there is implantation failure with the thin endometrium, but when we move to the left, the, there is a combination of PRP and stem cells, and because of the growth factors released, the, and uh, the stem cells creating a scaffold, there is implantation. So regenerative therapy by endometrial mesenchymal stem cells in thin endometrium uh, with repeated implantation failure. This was a study by Alberto, and uh, it was in 2020. So in this longitudinal and experimental study, endometrial changes before and after transfer of the mesenchymal stem cells in a population of thin endometrium women were evaluated with absence or hyporesponsiveness to estrogen and repeated implantation failures. So the endometrial thickness values before and after treatment with the uh, endometrial mesenchymal stem cells were 5.24 millimeters versus 9.93 respectively. The clinical pregnancy rate was 79.31%, a live birth delivery rate per embryo transfer was 45%, and the ongoing pregnancy rate was 24%. Now this was uh, an, the, the most current paper, 2022, Synergistic regenerative therapy of thin endometrium by human placental derived mesenchymal stem cells encapsulated within hyaluronic acid hydrogels. Um, this is a paper, we, we still have not we start practicing it, but it's uh, uh, probably it's going to come in, with, in, a sh in shortly. Now the human placental derived mesenchymal stem cells are emerging sources of stem cells with various advantages. The novel strategy to improve the thickness of the thin endometrium by human placental mesenchymal stem cells cross-linked with hyaluronic hydrogel. The stem cells could retain in the endometrium to promote proliferation, migration of stromal cells and the glandular cells, as well as angiogenesis, thereby improving implantation rates. Now, the conclusion of this study was that the subendometrial MSC inoculation produces significant increase in endometrial thickness. IVF after treatment yields a higher rate, a clinical pregnancy rate and a live birth rate. Now, our protocol for the stem cell therapy, the preparatory cycle on day six, we hysteroscopically subendometrial injection of PRP is done. On day 10, mesenchymal stem cells is put into the endometrial cavity. On day 14, stem cells once again into the cavity. Then you wait for a period. And the actual treatment cycle starts with estradiol, six milligram per day, maximum up to 12 milligram per day, and if necessary, we increase it more. Day 8, if it is less than 5 millimeters, we put PRP into the cavity. Day 11, if it is less than 6.5, PRP into the cavity. Day 14, less than 7.5, once again PRP into the cavity. You repeat PRP every 72 hours, maximum 5 doses, till the endometrial thickness reaches 9 millimeters. We can wait up to day 22, and once endometrial thickness is 9 millimeters, you start progesterone. There's still a few, a small group of patients who don't receive, who don't reach up to nine millimeters, but even if they reach seven millimeters, this is a very rigid group where even if you bring it up from four millimeters to seven, you've done a great job. And therefore, we can start the progesterone even at seven millimeters because pregnancies have been reported with seven millimeters. What is more important is to make sure that the vascularity is good the thickness is important, the pattern is important, and the vascularity is very important. So once you make sure that these three parameters are okay, you can put in the, um, um, I mean, you can start your progesterone and plan an embryo transfer. Now, the total number of patients we have done is 12, positive 6%, 50% in this group is something which is really great, and the negative patients are 2, 16.6%, and cancel cycles are 33.3%. So the current studies with PRP Compromise small number of cases and case studies. So mesenchymal stem cell application in the regeneration of thin endometrium is also current and in the research setting. More randomized controlled trials with high quality are needed before these can be recommended in routine clinical practice. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. For once we finish even before schedule.